In July 2011, Jim Clifford and I decided to take a two-day journey by water from my parents' cottage on Lake Joseph in Muskoka to my grandparents' cottage on Go Home River on Georgian Bay. I'd wanted to make this trip by canoe for many years, but had never got around to doing it. Now, as a historian writing about Muskoka, and with a good friend foolhardy enough to agree to attempt the 80-kilometer trip in two days, I was finally going from Joe to go home. Our trip was an excellent opportunity to experience in person the places where Muskoka's environmental history unfolded. I had read about many of the places we passed and thought about them with the help of maps and photographs, but hadn't traveled through the landscape the way people did during the late 19th century. Much of the environment Jim and I would move through was radically different from what people back then encountered. So while Jim and I would not be traveling through the same landscape that existed over a century ago, we would pass the material evidence of that history and discover the imprint people from an earlier period have left on the environment that exists today. Much of Muskoka's environmental history happened next to the shores and lakes of the rivers we would traverse. So come with Jim and I as we paddle downstream and back in time to discover the way the natural environment shaped society and culture in Muskoka, and in turn, the ways in which humans have modified the environment to suit their needs. Our journey started at the dock of my family's cottage on Lake Joseph. Lake Joseph is at the top of the watershed, so the rest of our journey would take us downstream, as Lake Joseph connects with Lake Rosso, which drains into Lake Muskoka at Port Carling, before emptying into the Moon River at Bala and branching off into the Musquash River, eventually flowing into Go Home Bay on Georgian Bay on Lake Huron. My family's cottage in Muskoka is not only where our canoe journey starts, it's also where my intellectual journey to understand Muskoka's environmental history began. My parents' cottage is old, as old as anything else Jim and I would pass in our trip. It was built in the 1880s for a lawyer from Toronto named James McLennan by a handful of local settlers who made a living building cottages during the late 19th century. I spent my summers growing up at this cottage. My understanding of Muskoka was shaped by the connection with the past this building and its history provided. It was different than other cottages. It was and is an artifact. And while I didn't quite understand the significance of this when I was young, as a historian I see my view of the past is influenced by my experience in this place. The questions I ask about Muskoka's history are informed by questions I have about how this cottage and places like it fit into Muskoka's present. As we set off across Lake Joseph, Jim and I felt pretty good for the first hour or two, with the sun still low in the sky and the wind at our backs. Making great headway. Oh, the novelty of that first morning. Just south of our starting point is Yoho Island, where Muskoka's first tourists established their campsite in the 1860s. Just two years after the first road into Muskoka was built, in 1858, two young men from Toronto ventured north to experience the wilderness. James Bain and John Campbell continued to return each summer, bringing more people with them. Campbell eventually bought Yoho Island and built a cottage in the early 1870s. Like many visitors then and now, Campbell and these early cottagers sought to escape the dirty, congested city in the summer and recuperate in a setting closer to nature. While people continue to escape the city these days, it's not altogether clear how nature is helping cottagers recuperate these days. Leaving Lake Joseph, we crossed the south end of Lake Rosso, where a very different Muskoka experience from that of Campbell and his friends emerged in the early 20th century. Originally located by William Norris and his family as free grant land in the 1860s, this land along the south shore of the lake was purchased shortly after the turn of the century and eventually transformed from farmland into a golf course. Opened in 1922, the Muskoka Lakes Golf and Country Club was designed by Stanley Thompson and has the distinction of being Muskoka's oldest 18-hole course. The creation of this golf course followed a general trend in the transformation of Muskoka's shoreline. Settlers who had little or no success as farmers quickly reinvented the homesteads and repurposed their shoreline properties from sites of production to sites of consumption, sites of labor to sites of leisure. By noon hour on our first day we were approaching Port Carling, the hub of the lakes in Muskoka. 
Boat traffic was beginning to pick up, and Jim and I started to mutter things under our breath about the boaters who didn't seem to appreciate the greatness of our journey. Mostly, we just didn't appreciate the waves. They made the canoe wobbly. During the 1850s and 1860s, Port Carling was an Ojibwe village known as Obajuano. As settlers moved into the region during the 1860s and 1870s, this village was displaced and the First Nations people eventually relocated to sites along Georgian Bay, most notably the Perry Island Reserve, which today is known as Wasoxing First Nation. Aboriginal people continued to return to Port Carling in the summer, mainly to sell crafts to tourists. And currently, portions of Port Carling are under land claims. Sadly, residents know very little about Muskoka's Aboriginal history. Institutions like the Muskoka Lakes Museum in Port Carling acknowledge the area's First Nations, but much of this history is obscured and forgotten. The park in the middle of Port Carling is named after former Lieutenant Governor of Ontario James Bartleman, whose mother was Aboriginal and who grew up in Port Carling. But this small, overgrown garden is perhaps more emblematic of how Aboriginal people are remembered in Muskoka today.